Toto and welcome to South Pacific Muscle. Today, uh, truly blessed to have my fucking good friend, my good friend Brunelli, who I haven't seen for a long, long time. Welcome on board, my bro. Cheers, Nate. Cheers, Mike. How are you guys doing? Pretty good here, bro. Living Pretty the good. dream. Living the dream. <laughs> Living the dream. Secondary teacher. You sure, bro? You sure? That that's been my stock answer for about the last four or five years. There's just varying degrees of sarcasm when I say it. At the moment, there's not too much. It's pretty good. Uh, good times. Good times. Hey, um, for those that don't know Bryn, um, Bryn and I met uh, way back in when I sort of came back into bodybuilding and Bryn was a skinny little fella. And um, I remember seeing him do his first bodybuilding show and I actually remember being quite blown away by how much progress Brent had made. But um, to be fair, while I've been off the scene and uh, coming back at having a look at some of his achievements in powerlifting, I was absolutely blown away. So what I think I might do is let Bryn sort of talk a bit about himself, a bit about the early days, because he's a, a man of uh, international flavor. Um, tell us where he grew up and that type of thing. And then Talk us about how he got into early sports and training and um, give us a bit of history. So I'll hand over to you, Bryn. Cheers, Nate. Yeah, so uh, basically I was born in Japan. So my mother's Japanese and my dad is, he's originally from Liverpool. So he came to Christchurch on the boats uh, with my grandparents when he was five uh, with his sister. So I'm half Scouser, half Japanese. <laughs> Christchurch wow. raised with a Welsh first name, a Japanese middle name, and an Irish last name. <laughs> oh, God, bro. You're so a mongrel. My, You're a mongrel. Yeah, pretty much. So my ancestors were from Waterford, Ireland, because I, I did all the family trees. So they were from Waterford, Ireland, and then they moved to Liverpool during the potato famine in the 1800s. So that's kind of my heritage on my dad's side is Irish and English. And my mum's side is Japanese, but mixed in there too. Because my granddad, uh, he was born on a Russian island called Sahalin. Wow. Yeah, and my, my great granddad, uh, he went to the Siberian War. My granddad went to the war in China. So I've got military lineage on my mum's side as well. I reckon uh, Irish, Scouser and Japanese might be the ideal mix for a fighter. Yeah, probably the temper. And, uh, you know, like, so just going back, uh, my brother, my older brother, he was a professional fighter. Um, and my other brother, he's a professional rugby player in Japan. Wow. So we all kind of grew up, because uh, my dad's a rugby man himself, we all kind of grew up doing rugby and kind of playing sport. But um, he put us all into judo when we were young. And... Myself and my oldest brother gravitated towards that, and my middle brother gravitated towards rugby. And then eventually, um, I was competing in judo as well. And then I got injured when I was about 17. And then I started getting into rehab and that. And then uh, my judo coach, uh, one of my judo coaches at the time, uh, was a personal trainer. And he had mentioned to me about the gym and things like that. And uh, I had mentors like my dad's friends who were involved in uh, rugby at the time. So strength and conditioning coaches. Mm. So from a very young age, I was kind of surrounded by athletes. So uh, from a young age around, yeah, probably around that 17, 18 mark, I started to become quite fascinated with muscle and getting stronger. Uh, You've got like a, like listening to your background, um, you know, like there's no surprise that you've ended up being a strength and conditioning coach, but with some specialization towards the fighting side of things and with, with athletes, because you, you were just immersed in it from day dot by the sound of it. Yeah, well, I guess, uh, so my pivotal moment for me was uh, my one of my dad's very close friends was the former All Blacks and Crusaders strength and conditioning coach, Ashley mm -hmm. Jones. Yep. Um, so I saw my first ever weight training program from him when I was 14. Um, and I asked him, I remember uh, he came over to my house yeah. and I asked him, oh, what do you do for work? And he said, oh, I help people uh, perform better. And I just became obsessed. I was like, oh, what do you do? And every time he came over, I would say, 
Can you show me like a program you do? Shit. And he gave me a full body, you know, a very like deadlift, squat, uh, upper body push, upper body pull, and things like that. And he just said, you know, uh, this is what a beginner's program would look like. Do that three times a week. And then I started to kind of think about, okay, is this how you train? And then, yeah, when I started to pick up weights, I had a few other people around me to guide me. And, um, you know, yourself included. Like, I remember, I remember one thing. You probably remember this. So um, a quote that you told me was, if you want to get something done, uh, send it to a busy person. Yeah, bro. Do you remember saying that? I remember you yeah. told me from day one. Yeah, I stole it off someone else, but um, yeah, words I use for sure, bro. I thought so, I, was, I was a bit scared there for a minute because I thought you were going to tell a story. <laughs> I was oh. thinking, fuck, don't tell a story, bro. Don't tell a story. What story? Uh, I was thinking about the viaduct. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's kind of, so this is, yeah, so this is, I guess, where, uh, I guess you and I have come full circle, Nate. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, an interesting story. You helped me out a lot when I was first getting started. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, um, growing up, I was picked on a lot as a kid at school because I was different. Mm. You know, so weight training for me became one of those things where I was like, okay, it's my thing. One thing that I can control and I'll just put everything into it. Mm. Mm. So I had that kind of mindset growing up where uh, I had a lot of people tell me I couldn't do stuff. So I just wanted to prove them wrong. But then eventually, like I had people like you and other people who just supported me. So, mm-hmm. you know, and now I think, I'm in a I position think, uh, a lot of us, A lot of us saw something in you that was probably quite unique. It was that you, you know, you were willing to learn and willing to listen and you were incredibly humble. And to be fair, in the scene that we were in at the time, there was a lot of ego driven people and, you know, yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, like yourself and, and Kagan Orton were two examples of guys that, you know, that really were always humble, always respectful. And, you know, to be fair, we probably learned as much from you as you did from us at the time about how we should carry ourselves in, in society and within our, um, within our sport. So, you know, it's, um, it's always a two-way street, the learning process, you know? Yeah, and I guess, so a lot of my training philosophies and a lot of my philosophies around coaching uh, have, I guess, come from people like yourself, but also my upbringing. So my dad, uh, he was ex-military, so he was territorial forces. Yep. And then, like I said earlier, my granddad uh, went to China for war and my great-granddad went to Siberian war. So I had, I guess, a very heavy... Uh, black and white influence from a young age Mm. so i remember my dad telling me you know he said if you're going to ask someone for help you better listen otherwise don't ask them because you're going to waste their time Mm. that's a great that's a great piece of advice Mm. you know and i remember i remember a good mutual friend of ours i was actually talking to him about it the other day and i learned a lot through a lot of the old school bodybuilders um Because for me, it was one of those things where, you know, some of the leg sessions, some of the sessions that I've done, it's been a test, like, of mental character for me. And I've always liked that challenge of people going, oh, I doubt you you can do it. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to show you. Yeah, hard. Bro, if if I went back then and, you know, even as I said, when I saw you doing the bodybuilding show, I was absolutely amazed at what you had managed to put on that stage. But, but now looking at the fact that, you know, I looked and you'd pulled a 300 deadlift. I've never pulled a 300 deadlift and I've tried my fucking ass off and I'm like, holy shit, you know, the amount of dedication and, and um, fortitude that you've shown to achieve some of these things it's pretty fucking incredible and I guess testament to that character and perhaps the, you know, the upbringing and those people around you that have sort of really, really, you know, driven that work ethic into you, which, um, you know, I think you had to have back in the days when we were training in Christchurch because um, I think everyone was, you know, pushing everyone as hard as they could and those that those that hung in and survived seemed to do well in whatever challenge they took on. Yeah, and I guess also, Nate, like you know a lot of 
a lot of friends of mine. So uh, one of my close friends that I've known for a long time, Jordan Earl. Yep. So we, when we grew up, you know, he obviously had these goals of uh, being Mr. New Zealand and things mm-hmm. like that. And we, I still remember to this day, me, him and Tom Mack, we were at the, uh, we were at the Rich Gaspari and Hira Yamagishi uh, seminar in Auckland. And, you know, Jordan looked at me and he goes, oh, bro, do I look big? How do I look? I remember those days. But, oh, God. Yeah. I'll a tell lot you of what, my friends, uh, you've got some good friends too, bro. I've got to yeah, say, you know, you like know. The, the names that you throw. As soon as you said Tom Mack, well, <laughs> I just couldn't help laughing. Oh, Tommy Two Guns, um, love to catch up with that guy again. I have, I've lost sort of touch with him. But um, Jordan Earl, um, he was kind enough to send me a uh, – a, a thing of pre-workout so i got a, a new pre-workout to try today um i'm not going to tell anyone the name of it but it's a um a pre-workout and oh my god i felt like i was fucking tripping it was so strong yeah. <laughs> it was nuts um so yeah you've you hit some really cool people around you along the way but you know you've you've certainly you know become your own man and um you know, you've got a lot of people sort of looking towards you now because of the knowledge you have. So just want to quickly give us a quick overview of first days in bodybuilding and then moving to powerlifting and, and some of the achievements along the way. Yeah, so I guess I guess for me, because um, even though when I was younger, I was always kind of like the the skinny fat kid. Mm. You know, like I, I put on body fat easy and I've never really been lean. So my first... Uh, show that I ever went and watched. Uh, Daniel Hibbs was on stage, yeah. and I saw that, and I was like, "Shit, I want to, I want to be that condition," you know. And then in my mind, um, I kind of didn't really have any idea of what bodybuilding was, except, okay, that's what you can look like. And then I kind of thought to myself, okay, like that's cool. And then. I guess it wasn't until I met uh, Dave Smith. Yep. And I was like, uh, okay, this is bodybuilding. <laughs> yeah, man. He was an early mentor for me as well. Um, you know, and, and Carmen back in the day when Carmen was around, you know, I just used to look at awe at them. And um, yeah. they kind of made you level up, didn't they? You know? Yeah, because, yeah. So I guess... Yeah. I guess for me, that was kind of my influence. But um, ultimately, when I did, I'm a very numerical person. So I love numbers. Yep. It's just the way, that I, the way that I tick. So when I first did my uh, bodybuilding show, and Kent Gibson, um, he helped me yep. with my diet. Yeah. Another big mentor of mine. I've looked up to him for years. He still helps me to this day. Um, and... Yeah, I, I put on body fat easy. So what I had to do to get that lean, it's not something that really appealed to me. So I was on, just to give people an idea, I was on uh, half a cup of oats. Uh, that was my only source of carbs for maybe 12 weeks. Holy Every shit. day. And I was doing 45 minutes cardio a day. Bro, that hurts listening to that, man. That is that yeah. is some torturous shit. Was that just just as much as like I, I hold Kent as someone who is the one of our top and probably most, um, you know, he's not in the limelight. No, you know, a lot of yeah, people yeah. don't know who Kent is, but Kent is a phenomenal prep coach. But hearing that story, I'm never going to him. <laughs> yeah, so pretty much he was straight with me from yep. day one and he said, look, your body type, he said, we're going to have to bring the carbs down and you're going to have to pound the cardio in order to get lean. So he said, if you want to do bodybuilding, you're going to have to accept the fact that that's what your body type responds to and that's what you have to do. So he was very black and white with me from day one. And he said, if you want to do bodybuilding, you better fucking be prepared to do all this stuff. So I did it for that prep. Yep. And then afterwards, I guess, I kind of looked at it and went, okay, my numbers went down a bit. And then I thought to myself, okay, well, what do, I, what do I want to do? And then, you know, training training in Christchurch, Eastside Barbell, things like that. Mm-hmm. I guess powerlifting for me had, had always been one of those things where you can be big and you can be strong, but you don't really have to worry too much about being lean. Yeah. 
I'm not saying it's an excuse to, you know, throw everything in the kitchen sink and eat whatever you want. Because there's that flip side. Like, I'm not a big believer in um, people using powerlifting as an excuse to be fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I guess that was that was kind of my transition. And then, um, yeah, from there, I went and worked in Japan uh, with a professional rugby franchise for a year and a half. Nice. As a strength and conditioning. How was, uh, how was that, bro? How was that? Yeah, so for me, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like uh, the knowledge that I gained was real good. Yep. Uh, but I went, so because I'm half Japanese, I've got a Japanese passport. I went on a Japanese passport. So I worked as a Japanese citizen. Um, and it wasn't really uh, the greatest experience in terms of working. Yep. Just because for me, you know, I've grown up in Christchurch my whole life. And I, I speak, I read and, and I can write Japanese pretty well. Um, but for me, it was one of those things where I went over and they expected me to know the culture inside out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be very, you know? very different to ours, wouldn't it? Yeah, like I, I know I know most of the culture, but not, not in, in that sense of like a corporate setting. Mm. So an example for me, one of, one of the big culture shocks for me was you know, went to the cafeteria. This is this is a rugby team, so it was quite like a lad culture. Mm, yeah. And I was the youngest there, and we finished eating. And one of the players goes, "Oh, Brent, you can put all our plates away." And I like, I like looked at him, and I was like, "What?" And then one of my mates, who was uh, he's from the American island of Japan that used to be occupied by America back in the day. Uh, he's from Okinawa, and he spoke English, so he just said to me, "He's like, bro, just do it. It's just that's just what you're going to have to do." It'll be hard being a New Zealand boy. Yeah, so in my mind, I was like, yeah, they're, they're calling me Japanese, but like I wasn't brought up this way. So yeah. there was a lot of conflict in my mind in that way. Um, and I had always wanted to do that job, but I had just finished my degree and um, I was there with my mentor. But the conditions that I was supposed to work there on kind of changed and for me it was one of those things where i wasn't ready to look after a whole team i just got out of uni yeah. so the deal was i was supposed to be with my mentor for the whole time but obviously something went wrong with his contract so he had to leave and he had to go elsewhere for work so oh. i was kind of i was you know in the deep in Shits creek yeah. Um, yeah. kind of doing my best but i gained a lot so uh, I'll give a shout out to one of my very good friends and mentors, Phil Mooney. He was the ex Queensland Reds head coach, mm -hmm, Otago. Mm -hmm. um, and now he works at Brisbane Grammar. He taught me pretty much everything I know about the coaching aspect. Yep. Awesome, bro. So, yeah, I guess what I've been able to do is I've been able to merge uh, everything I learned over in Japan from mm. my rugby mentors. And when I came back, so interesting story. Uh, that I'll tell you. So my mentor, Ashley Jones, he said to me a couple of weeks before he left for Scotland, he looked at me and I was down in the dumps because I knew he was leaving and I was like, mm. just scared. I don't know what I was going to do. And he goes, look, this is what you, he looked at me and he goes, this is what you're going to do when you go back to New Zealand. And I said, what? He goes, you're going to compete in the under 90 weight class. You're going to deadlift 300 kg. You're going to win national titles and you're going to set records. And I looked at this guy and I was like, who the what, what the what are you telling me <laughs> because the situation at the time for me i couldn't really comprehend why he was saying that yeah um and i caught up with him in january and now he's going to he's the head of performance uh at the houston Sabercats in texas yeah, yeah. and he said to me he was like do you remember that time uh we were in the gym and we had that chat and i said yeah and he said well, i said that to you because I wanted you to believe that you could do it. And then he said, you ended up doing it. Yeah, bro. So that was pretty surreal for me once I actually did it. Uh, and I messaged him because pretty much what happened for me, uh, this is a this is like another pivotal moment. So when I 
the tail end of my time in Japan, I couldn't really train because I was just working way too much. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, as soon as I get off that plane, I'm getting in my garage and I'm going to train six days a week. Yeah. And that's exactly what I started doing. That's it's just funny, bro. Thing, it's it's you know? funny, like, you know, you know the old saying in, in, in um, well, you get it in fight sports, but in other sports, is, you know, where the head, where the head goes, the body follows. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that applies in a more, you know, um, I don't know, an, over, an overview sense. Like, you know, if your mind believes something and, you know, you're going to do that, you'll fucking do it. You know, just like you're being dragged by your head and your body follows. So, you know, the fact that it kind of taught you that, you know, whatever you put your mind to is achievable, is a, that's a fucking pretty big moment, man. You know? Yeah, and I guess, I guess for me, Nate, like as, as a kid, um, a big mentor of mine was my big brother. Mm. So it would be pissing down with rain. And you know what Christchurch rain is like? Yeah, bro. You know, and we were, uh, I think I was 12. My brother would have been 15. We were biking to judo. Yep. And I looked at him and he saw the look in my eye like, why the fuck are we doing this? And he said to me, he goes, so the people we compete against are probably training three times a week. So he said, if they're training three times a week, we have to do five. Yeah, bro. And I looked at my brother and I said, okay, he's my idol. I will do whatever the fuck he says. And then my brother ended up, um, you know, he ended up fighting in the pro circuit. Uh, he's trained with guys like Dan Hooker, yeah. uh, Kai Kara France, like pretty household names. Mm -hmm. And he's did okay himself. And now he does um, jujitsu and he's got his own dojo out in Newland. And he works oh, awesome. at Dan Hooker's gym. So I guess for me, I've always had uh, people who have told me things. And as a kid, I always kind of absorbed it. And I was like, yeah. okay, how can I interpret what they're saying into my actions? You're pretty cerebral motherfucker, bro, I've got to say. You're, um, you know, the way you, you pull information and don't just let it slide, like, a lot of us hear things and think, oh, that's good. But then we don't take the next step and go, how can I incorporate that in what I'm doing to make myself perform better? Which is, I think, the, the step that you've sort of really shown that you, you do kind of quite religiously. Yeah. And I guess, I guess it's very interesting that you use the word cerebral because uh, a good friend of mine, Dan Hooker, I was talking to him not long ago. And when we had a chat, he said that he considers himself a cerebral fighter and a cerebral coach. And I've been coached by him. I've watched him coach and just detail after detail after detail, you know, and that to me was kind of like, okay, this is, this is my language. Nice. Nice. It's fucking, it's like to me, watching someone operate at that level um, is like watching a, master painter painter painting you know like they're just so meticulous they cover off all the bases and you kind of sit there and just a little bit in awe um you know you've got to kind of put that all to one side so that you can soak up what's what's going on but they're just they're, they're a master of their craft essentially yeah and i guess um that's something that i firmly believe in so you kind of just talked about uh, mastering a craft so I think the biggest the biggest issue within strength and conditioning uh, and within the fitness industry we have is um, too many people try and be jack of all trades, a master of none. Mm -hmm. So for me, even though I'm a powerlifter, I'm not a powerlifting coach. That's not my thing. I don't coach powerlifters specifically. Mm -hmm. It's not what I truly enjoy. What I enjoy is helping athletes. And powerlifting is a sport. They are strength athletes, but for me, it's just kind of like, that's my sacred thing. That's what I do. So I don't want it to get old. Yep. So that's why I don't train any powerlifters. Yeah. yeah, I've said that before. People say to me, why don't you personal train? And I'm saying, because the gym's my time. Yeah. And when I'm in there, I enjoy myself. It's my, it's my fucking special place where I can be amongst my fucking thoughts without too much carnage going on and I can get shit done. And I don't want to ever think of that as a job or a burden. Um, so for me, I kind of steered away from that. And like, I guess like with you, you with your powerlifting, you know, 
your powerlifting's your thing um and you specialize in something you know slightly different which you know a lot of the skills and, and the learning that you take from that comes across but you're not having to uh teach the same thing every day and then go and learn it yourself exactly so i guess the biggest the biggest thing when it comes to strength and conditioning is i believe in generalizing first so uh like uh me you and mike spoke about before it's kind of like training my idea is you can't compete you can't do one show and call yourself a bodybuilding specialist coach mm-hmm. or do bodybuilding training for a year and call yourself a transformation specialist yeah 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 you you it's just like you can't cheat the system yeah yeah you know there's there's levels to this game so in my opinion um i guess it's one of those things where you have to earn your stripes you have to have your time under the bar it's hard hard yeah yeah i think that's one of the things that mike and i very much agree on i like look i'm quite a you know i quite like the sciencey stuff i've got the science background and i like the research and all that but I also truly believe that without your time in the trenches, you know, your fucking, your word's not really worth a lot when it comes to that. So I kind of say my ideal coach is the guy in a lab coat with 20 inch arms, you know? So good way of summarizing it, I suppose. Hey, look, um, what we might do is just quickly jump across. I just want to have a look at um, uh, your Insta and, and your website, just so people can see who you are. So just bringing that one up there. So for those people that want to follow Bryn, Samurai Strength, um, and it's, it's got some cool stuff on it. It's got lots of videos, bro. I was having a look through your videos. There's some cool shit on there. Oh, and then the boys, the boys. But yeah, there's some, some, uh, some really good videos. There's some quite cool photos of uh, some celebs with you. Uh, but there's some good stuff in there. Uh, I had a bit of a dig down. A celeb, a celeb like uh, Tom Mack there. <laughs> Tom Mack is in bodybuilding circles is God. Everyone knows that. Yeah, there's some cool stuff. Lots and lots of uh, lots of rolling and stuff in there. So, um, if you're interested in um, fight sports and and strength and conditioning, jump on board on that one. And if you're interested in Bryn's um, services, he's got um, his, his uh, web page here samuraistrength.com uh, and it's got all the info that you can have a, have a look through there talks about Bryn's uh, powerlifting successes, I still can't get over the lifts you did bro, I just yeah, massive man, massive and some videos here too, awesome yeah, um, I hope to exceed them soon Nate so, uh, oh yeah I know, I know you always yeah, you know it's bro. one of those things where I'm never happy with you know what it's like, you get uh, to 90kg yeah. you get to 100kg and it's like where to from here yeah. Hey, and you're doing you're doing a podcast as well, Summer I Speaks. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So I haven't done one in a while, but yeah. uh, the next one that I've got lined up is again with Dan Hooker. Yeah, that'll be good, man. I actually spotted that before, and I thought that it would be um, a look if you're into fight sports. And Xavier, talking to you, buddy, go and check that out. I know Xavier loves um, Dan Hooker as well, so um, it'd be, be good to hear from him. Um, but you go through there, have checked that stuff out. Right, Bryn, uh, should we um, get to brass tacks and, and talk about what is the difference in terms of, you know, training an athlete or a fighter versus training a bodybuilder? Because, look, I can train a bodybuilder quite happily. Yeah. I can train a powerlifter and a strongman quite happily. But if you said to me, look, can you train a, a kid that's doing jiu-jitsu or a kid that's doing boxing, I'd kind of go... I don't know. Um, yeah. A little bit vague, you know? Yeah, okay. So as an example, we'll use your son as an example. So the biggest difference is as an athlete, you train movements, not muscles, yeah. right? So in bodybuilding, it's all about feeling the working muscle. Yeah, you use heavy weight, but you're trying to target a certain muscle. So if you're doing dumbbell rows, you don't want to be feeling anything in your bicep because that's yeah. otherwise you're just moving the weight. Can we can we just highlight that point to people, man? Like I say it about bodybuilding all the time. It's not the movement you're training, it's the muscle. But when we come to athletes, um, it's not how an athlete looks, it's how an athlete performs, and so it's about training the movement, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so pretty much all my athletes, when I first start with them, I have a system and I wrote it down. So I have a system that I've developed that I guess helps me identify a lot of people's weaknesses. So the reason why we do something like that is whatever predisposition or weakness they have structurally. So if they have, um, for example, a weak left glute or a weak left hamstring or, you know, weak rotator cuffs, in my mind, when they get into impact or under pressure in scenarios that will make these areas work harder, mm. it's kind of going to be vulnerable, yep. you know, and susceptible to injury. So my whole thing is structural balance. And I guess I learned a lot of this through having my own chiropractor. Yeah. So I've had my own chiropractor, Chris, for four years now. And when I first uh, did my back, uh, it was about four weeks out from a GBC competition. Ooh, and close, I man. messaged Jordan Earl and I said, yep. my back's fucked. What should I do? He said, go see a Cairo. You won't regret it. Mm -hmm. And I do listen to him because he's a good mate of mine. And I couldn't deadlift for four weeks. And that, at that meet, I pulled 280. Damn. Damn. Hey, uh, for those people down your way, what's your Cairo's name? I'm sure there's uh, a Chris ton. Cannon from Sports Med on there BLS. You go, guys. There you go, guys. Chris Cannon, Sports Med, if you're uh, busted up like uh, most of us are in some way, shape, or form. Um, go and see, oh, see him, and you'll be able to deadlift 280 kilos, guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, so I guess, I guess uh, Nate and Mike, like, I, I learned a lot from him because – he said to me, he was like, oh, this is wrong with your body. These are the structural imbalances you have. And because he told me that, I knew how to work on them because that's my job. Yep. I know how to strengthen. So I became fascinated with that side of things. So I incorporated that into my system. And I've got my own mobility coach as well. Uh, Elliot Connolly at Snap Fitness The Palms. He's uh, one of the best judo athletes in New Zealand as well. And he's one of the coaches that looks after me whenever I've done judo. Um, and I guess for me, Nate, just kind of going back to the whole athlete thing, for me, when you, when you are surrounded by top-level athletes, it's kind of, you can't help but soak in all, all this knowledge. You know, and then, and then you talk about, you talk with them, oh, what's your training like? Oh, yeah, this is how I train. And then it kind of, yeah, I'm a cerebral guy, so I start to think. So I guess the biggest thing for any athlete is you have, a, you have to establish um, like a strength base. That's pretty much a given. Yep. So any athlete I work with, um, we do uh, muscle testing. So like I said, we achieve structural balance. And then that will dictate like the kind of warm-ups they do. So remedial exercises. So, for example, if they have rotator cuff issues, of course, they're going to be doing rotator cuff exercises. If they have ankle mobility issues, of course, they're going to be doing ankle mobility drills and things like that. Is, is your diagnostic uh, testing in that uh, isolating the muscles? Because you talk about training movements rather than muscles. When you're doing that assessment or diagnostic work on where the weak points are, do you start isolating those muscle groups? Yeah, to try so that's, yeah. that's, yeah. So all my testing, Mike, is it's all isolating that muscle group to see how strong it is against force. Mm. So as an example, um, one of the hamstring tests I use is simple knee flexion. So you get someone lying on the ground, you do a single leg curl with them against your hand and I've had this happen so someone's left side very very strong you do it on the right side it comes down like butter so that tells me there's an issue right there of needing to do single leg work for hamstring. yeah I was, I've, I've always been told that the major causes of injury are usually either a strength imbalance or a flexibility imbalance across a joint you know one side or the other strong on one side weak on the other you're risking injury tight on one side, loose on the other, risking injury. Yeah, pretty much. Because what happens uh, when you are under force or in impact, if the muscle or the structure isn't strong enough to withstand it, it's going to get injured. Or if you're doing a lift and your force is shifted to one side and that side is overloaded, 
of course, you're going to get injured. Like a perfect example is, um, did you guys see that video on Larry Wheels' Instagram? I haven't seen it. It was peak injury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah, so that's a perfect example of using a weight that the guy couldn't control at all. Is that the guy in Dubai, Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Dave asked me, he said, oh, have you seen the video? And I said, I don't watch videos like that because it fucks with my mental game, you know? <laughs> but look, it does, bro. If I'm pushing it on bench, the last thing I want to think about is fucking, you know, the, yeah. the catastrophic effects of things going wrong, you know? Yeah, but I guess, yeah, so pretty much for me, I guess a few of my philosophies are movement over muscles for athletes, establishing um, a movement base. So when I mean a movement base, so all my programs are pretty much squat, hip, hip hinge, upper body push, upper body pull, uh, lower body pull as well. So that'll be knee flexion. We're going to do rotations in there and we're going to do a carry. So a carry is... Ideally, if you have access, it will be like your ambles or bag carries or things like that. So um, the reason why I asked you, Nate, is especially for your son, bag carries and things like that are real good for jujitsu yep. and your yep. grip and just being able to hold that position of your hands together. I found an anvil the other day. I was at a mate's house and uh, walked into a shed to see his Harley. And right when I walked in, there was a huge anvil and it was one of the ones that are 160 kilos uh, and i and i remember carrying that one at uh, new zealand's strongest man and, and doing pretty well in it and i sort of pushed it with one hand and went no nah, i'm not going to try that now <laughs> <laughs> and i so i won't i won't push dave in the, in the direction of that one but um your bag carries man good stuff. So i see colm um colm wolf is starting to throw a few of those into his training at the moment yeah it's, it's just one of those things like uh i guess that kind of training is pretty applicable to anyone if you want to do something at the end of your workout. But yeah, typically for for fighters. So it all depends on their level and their workload. So as an example, we'll use your son as an example. Mm -hmm. So you told me he rolls anywhere from, you know, four to five days a week. Yeah. And he does his own cardio. So for me, as a fighter, the fight training is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then you go with, okay, where do we fit in the weights and what aspects do they need to work on? So for me, I know you and I had this uh, friendly discussion. So in my opinion, Xavier's 16. If you have him doing one upper and one lower a week, that's not enough stimulation for a, a young kid who's trying to grow into a weight class. Yeah. Yep. So if you're trying to grow into a weight class, you want to be training around three times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't mean splitting them up. So if I was if I was to train your son, mm -hmm. basically what I would do is I would do uh, two full body strength sessions and one strongman kind of circuit session. So that's strongman kind of circuit session. Uh, like I told you, you can do it in many different ways, but you do. So some, some things that I've done for some fighters in the past have basically been uh, five minute rounds, one minute, five exercises. Yep. And then you rest 30 seconds and then you repeat that four times. Sounds fucking brutal, bro. From a bodybuilder's perspective, I'm looking at it going, oh, yeah. holy shit, that would kill me. But then when you, when you look at it, it's yeah. one of those things. So for, for a lot of fighters, and this is where I guess um, a lot of coaches and a lot of new people wanting to get into strength and conditioning go wrong, is that it's, it's great to get a mentorship and pay for a mentorship by an established fight coach. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of these people don't understand is a lot of these established fight coaches or fight SNC coaches, they've fought, they've grappled, they've boxed, mm -hmm. they've actually done it. Yeah. So for me getting a mentorship is all well and good but the question that i'd ask these people is do you know what it like what it feels like to have someone on top of you trying to choke you out trying to take your back you know hand fighting do you know what it's like to blow your arms out if you don't that's probably your priority because you know um my thing is you need to be able to empathize with the people you're working with 
you know? And yeah. if you don't know what it feels like to get hit or something that I learned from uh, Coach Carl Weber, Coach Hostile. So he said to me when I was training with him, he said, if you have a guy up against the cage, he said, and you're holding him, wait for, to hear him breathe. And he said, on the time that he gets his breath in, punch him in the stomach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't learn these things unless you actually go see a fight coach and you're doing the training. I think, I think, I think you, what, you, what you're pointing out for, um, to me kind of really resonates because I look at it from the perspective of um, when guys are getting prepped for a show by someone who hasn't done a show. Yeah. I'm like, how does that yeah, prep yeah. coach empathise with that person when they're going through those stages that the brain doesn't work, you're doubting yourself, you fucking think you're going to die, um, and all those kind of things if you haven't been through it. So if you haven't been fucking punched in the face repetitively and choked out and had your arms hyperextended, how do you train someone that that's the norm for them? Yeah, and, and, that, and that's precisely that. So my, my thing is, like, it, it's all well and good having the knowledge, but you can't cheat the system again. So I guess I have an issue um, having had to do an internship myself. So when I first started in Japan, I was on a holiday and Ash Jones said to me, he's like, right, you can come uh, do an internship with me for a month on one condition. And I said, okay, what's that condition? You have to start in the gym with me 4.30 a.m. every single morning. This was in winter in Japan where it snowed. It was raining. And I said to him, I was like, okay, fuck, I'll do it. And this was, I was sleeping on my mate's floor. You know, but I had that determination. I was like, this guy is giving me a chance. I will do whatever it takes to get that chance. And then that's how I eventually got the job. Yeah. Um, so I guess for me, my thing is if you persist and if you do the hard work, you'll eventually get there. So I don't see how these people these days, especially with social media, you know, um, there's very different... Uh, to our day, I guess when I first met you, we didn't have that. It was either you worked hard or you were a pussy. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, bro. Simpler hey, times. Yeah, simpler, simpler times. times. Yeah, yeah. Suit, suit simple men like me. Uh, Mike, I know you had some questions for Bryn Round training. Oh, you yeah, look, I mean, you've answered a few of them along the way because I know nothing about, you know, how yeah. a training week or day would be structured. So, I mean, it sounds like it's quite individual depending on where the weaknesses are for the athletes. Yeah. But I was sort of, for the sort of ignorant person like myself, what sort of percentage of your training week or your training session would be cardio, uh, skills-based stuff or resistance training? Um, or do you kind of tend to combo them both? It sounds like the, the strongman rounds are, will be hot, pretty cardiovascular, uh, but also yeah. with so the muscular guess... endurance. So I guess it all depends on the individual, Mike. So I can use myself personally as an example. So when I got back into judo uh, at the start of last year, just because I needed a bit of a break from powerlifting, like my my year, competitive year in 2019 wasn't that great. So I wanted to get back to martial arts to further my knowledge for training fighters. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I spent that year just doing a lot of martial arts. So for me... I was unfit as anything. You go from powerlifting back into fighting. I had no cardio. Yep. Um, I was I was like the tin man. Bro, I can relate. I went from strongman to jujitsu. Oh, and, yeah. and I trained three times a week and I spewed up three times a week for five weeks straight before I stopped spewing up. That's how fucking different the conditioning was. So yeah. I hear you, bro. So I guess, yeah, it, it all depends on the individual, but you can have, so I've trained um, a friend of mine who's a Samoan heavyweight. He's an amateur going on the cusp of pro, very, very strong guy, but lacks the conditioning and lacks the footwork. So a lot of what I have told him to do in his boxing sessions away from me is to get his boxing coach to take him through a lot of footwork drills. Um, you know, and then when he comes to me, we've done a lot of footwork and directional change 
just to make sure that he moves on his feet properly because with boxing uh, and striking in general, everything comes from the ground. So if you don't know how to transfer your force accurately onto your opponent, you're not going to be able to, I guess, give them as much damage as you can. Mm. You know, and, th and that, so an example can be you're punching with your arm and shoulder versus using your whole body. Yeah. And that's, that's something that I've learned along the way. And I've trained with a friend of mine in Australia, Steve Moxon. He was a world champion kickboxer. And Stone Cold a, Steve Moxon. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. He's, he's a mate of mine. And um, <laughs> I went and trained with him. And he, these yeah. are the things that I've done, Nate, because... That was after Pro Raw. So I competed in Pro Raw. And the next yep. day I went to Geelong on an hour train. And I said to him, I was like, mate, I just competed. I don't give a fuck. Take me through a session. Ooh. <laughs> but my mindset <laughs> yep. is I want to learn as much as I can. Yep. So I understand what the people that I train need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So, yeah, just going back to your question, Mike, is typically it all depends on the rounds, so you've got the energy system. So you've got your ATP, PC, you've got your glycolytic and you've got your oxidative. So depends on the person. So if you have someone who has good endurance and they can go the rounds, but they lack power, then strength is going to be the thing that they need to work on, strength and power. But if you have someone who's the opposite, kind of like myself, then you will still maintain and work on your strength. But your conditioning and your ability to apply that power repetitively over rounds will be your focus. Yeah. One of the things that, that um, two um, fight coaches that I re really respect. So Steve Oliver and also um, Kev Honey Badger. So if you know, either oh, yeah. of them, um, they both said to me very similar things, but essentially saying that, strength and technique together are a lethal combination and yeah. i think um you, you sort of pointed out that you can be a very strong guy and i found this out the hard way and you go into a jiu-jitsu type situation or a fighting situation and you can't actually apply that strength to yeah. the activity you're doing because you know either technically or your you know aerobic capacity is just balls like mine was so um you know how do you how do you ensure that that the strength that they're, that they're getting through training is directly transferable to their um their actual activity of fighting yeah so i guess it's it's one of those things where transferability is the most important mm -hmm. so that's where exercise selection and execution comes into play so i don't care if you can deadlift 300 kg if you can't hold a gi or hold your opponent down, that's no use to me. Yeah. So what we focus on is the aspects of the sport. So an example could be, you know, grip, grip strength is something that's very important in grappling and in MMA in general. So doing exercises that transfer over, that give you strength, but also give you the necessary uh, physical characteristics that you need for your martial art is important. So an example could be trap bar deadlift is extremely important for fighting because you're in a more upright position. Um, it's a bit more quad dominant and it works the hell out of your grip. Mm. And also similar thing with, um, you know, sled drags or prowler pushes or things like that. You're pushing against resistance, you know, and I guess, the, trans, the whole transferability thing comes down to if you are stronger in a certain movement pattern that is used in your sport, you, I guarantee you will be stronger anyway. Yeah, man. Look, it sounds like um, fascinating. I'd, I'd love to know more. Something that I really, you know, I, you know, I feel well out of my depth, but like most, um, like most guys in bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, we all enjoy watching, you know, all the combat sports. Um, most of us in awe at these guys, um, you know, the, the condition that they're in and, and in terms of the, the uh, performances they put on. But um, it's certainly a lot more complex than bodybuilding in my eyes. You know, I'm sort of thinking there's a lot more to, to factor into the equation. 
yeah and i guess it's one of those things where um so an example could be if you want to work on your rotational strength or your core strength from the side doing a side plank or something like that may be good to warm up with but doing a side plank for your obliques isn't really going to transfer too much versus if you do something like a suitcase deadlift yep yeah it's extremely transferable because you've got the weight distributed on one side of your body you're having to stay upright and it kind of mimics the motion of someone trying to pull you down and you have to resist that with your core yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so these are the things that you need to think about. And, and I guess things that I think about are, you know, front squats. So safety bar squats. Um, you know how they pull you forward, right? As I found out the other day, doing them for the second or third time in two years, they just fucking buckle you with the camber, right? Eh? Yeah. So because they pull you forward, it kind of forces you to stay more upright Yep. and get your upper back a bit tighter, which is important because if someone gets you in a clinch and your upper back collapses and your head is down, looking at their knee, you're fucked. <laughs> yeah, bro. Yeah. You know, so they, these are the kind of things that I look at. Um, and I guess, you know, so, I've managed I've managed fighters as well. I've yeah. seen a lot of fighters to Japan. And through that relationship, I've had people ask me, hey, this is what I'm doing for my strength and conditioning. What do you think of it? Yeah. And I've consulted to a couple of them and, you know, they've gone a bit better. But the most important thing is knowing that all the training you're doing throughout the week has a purpose. So the key word is basically intent. So when you go into the gym, I'm sure hoping that you have an idea of what exactly you need to do during that session what Absolutely. your numbers are yep. what muscle you're trying to feel what the goal is for that particular session right so yep. if someone comes to me and says oh yeah i want to get fitter but doesn't specify what they want to do i don't really have an idea of what their intent is you know, so so it's having, about being about being about crystallizing what your intent actually is. What are you trying to achieve? So what, what do you, you want to be able to do that you can't do now? Yeah, pretty much. So, so I guess another another topic that I want to talk about is we've seen fighters gas out within the first round. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a sufficient enough. Uh, aerobic capacity and also an anaerobic capacity it's not something that should happen because it happens more so with the inexperienced guys the guys who don't know how to pace themselves mm. so Nate did, have, did you follow uh, much of the early UFC or not really uh, bits and pieces bro bits and pieces do you remember a guy called uh, Phil Baroni no no so I'll tell you a funny story about him. Uh, he was an ex-bodybuilder, amateur bodybuilder, uh, wrestler, and then got into MMA. And he did a video uh, about probably about 10 years ago. And someone said, Phil, who do you work with for strength and conditioning? And he said, fuck strength and conditioning coaches. I work in, he's like, I do my own training in here. And he's like, have you seen the way that I look? Have you seen my muscles? <laughs> and he, he, was, he was a good fighter back yeah. in the day. But he was one of those guys, overly muscled, extremely explosive and powerful, but just gas out. like that. Early days of uh, Marius Pudzianowski's transfer from body, uh, yep. strongman to powerlifting, um, I saw him go purple in a, in a match and just basically give up. And then, um, you know, going down the track, um, obviously had the win against Gracie, etc. But he had dropped probably... 15 kilos of muscle and become a, a you know he, he had to change what he had to, in order to be able to compete in that because you know what what yeah. he had in strongman wasn't directly transferable to his his um mma career mm. yeah so it, it all comes down to uh have you heard of the said principle so s-a-i-d what's that one for bro so specific adaptation to impose demands no 
Took a so short break. what that basically means, this is uh, something I learned off Westside Barbell. Yeah. So Louis Simmons trains a lot of MMA fighters. Yeah. And yeah. I remember him talking about doing a circuit that was five five-minute rounds with 30 seconds in between. But his gym is laid out ideally for a fighter because you can go from one station to the next, yeah. to the next, to the next, yeah, to the next, yeah, yeah. because it's not a public gym. Yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah. for the for the people that I train, I try and set that up within the means that I have. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you, man, because, you know, like even getting two bits of equipment to do a giant set in bodybuilding can be, can be pretty hard work in a commercial gym, you know? Yeah, so it, I guess it's just it's just knowing uh, what you need to work on and how you need to train. I guess like like I said, it's one of those things from the whole West Side Barbell thing. It's that the weak the weak point training. Yeah, bro, that resonated with me actually when you said that. The first thing I thought of was Louis Simmons, and I thought, you know, their whole principles were about finding the weak points, bringing up the weak points and then working out what the new weak point was and bringing yeah. that up. So it was a constant process of, of building a stronger machine, essentially. Yeah, so I guess my thing is, I don't believe in, if someone has a strength, you don't just completely disregard the strength and work on all their weaknesses because mm -hmm. then you're not nurturing that strength. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, so if someone... So an example, we can use uh, the guy that I trained. So uh, Samoan heavyweight boxer, mm -hmm. extremely strong dude, but he's very, very strong, but he's not good at repeating those efforts of strength. Yep. So something that I did with him was we did, uh, have you heard much about uh, lactate training? Over to Mike. Yep. Yep. So have you heard much about uh, lactate training, Mike? Yeah, so manipulating your rest intervals to stack lactate or remove yeah, lactate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so pretty much what I did with this big guy because he was very strong for one set and then you rest a couple minutes and repeat kind of thing. So I said to him, I said, you think about it this way. What's the point of going in to the pocket because he's a boxer and being able to do a few combos, but then stepping out and being so gassed that you can't repeat that until, you know, the round's almost over. Because that's pretty much what was happening in the gym. Mm -hmm. So what I said to him was, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do a circuit. So we did uh, upper body push, upper body pull, lower body push, lower body pull. Then we did... Uh, one minute on the assault bike. And we did that for five rounds. Yeah. I think I'm going to stick to bodybuilding, bro. It sounds brutal, but look, you know, um, as they always say, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle, bro. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those things that I guess like um, fighting is one of those sports where you have to be prepared for anything. So, your ability to be able to repeat those intense efforts is very important, yep. but being able to, this is where I guess people get a lot very blurred. So I don't have anything. I leave all the fighting stuff to the fight coach. Yep. I'm not a yep. fight coach. That's yep. not, you know, the fight coach will tell them their strategy and their game plan and things mm -hmm. like that. What my job is, is to work on, all their physical characteristics so they have the physical capacity to be able to apply execute their fight plan yeah to be able to apply the fight plan and what the coach says so an example can be you know it's one of those things where i've noticed in a lot of people and i've had a rugby player do it recently too a few strengthen the hamstrings the posterior chain it's going to be pretty hard to take you down if you've got a strong pair of hamstrings and glutes and lower yeah. back. Yeah. And especially, and this is, this is one of the things too where a lot of people don't understand, is if someone is doing a lot of wrestling training and someone is doing a lot of sprawling, that puts a lot of strain on their lower back. So 
with training a fighter or training any athlete in, in general, you have to always be able to adapt to the plan. So I had that today, actually, at work. I had a rugby player. Um, when he came and saw me earlier in the week, he had played 40 minutes. He has a prop, bit of contact. He told me his shoulder was stiff. Um, and we were supposed to do high bar squats. Yeah. Yeah. So we changed it to safety bar. Yep. Ideally, in the perfect world, I would have used the cambered bar. Yeah, yeah, to take that load out, eh? Yeah, to take mm. that load out. So these are the things that, uh, as a strength and conditioning coach, this is what makes a strength and conditioning coach different from uh, a normal personal trainer. Is it's more about problem solving. Mm. So you have to be able to think on the spot because what I don't understand is, you know, um, a very good example is if someone has a fight on a Saturday and they win the fight within a minute, a knockout. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense for them to take that whole week off the week after and not do any training? Probably not. No, no. Whereas if they had a battle for five, five minute rounds and they come out of it pretty black and blue, that's mm -hmm. a different story. Then you yeah. might want them to rest a couple of days and then ease their way back into training. Yeah. And this is where I guess um, I learned this philosophy through my mentor, Ash Jones, because he said to me, he made the system when we were in Japan and he said, right, I'm going to create a system and I want you to follow closely. He said, what people do the week after a game or a match will be dictated by how much fatigue they have from the weekend of their game or match. So we had a system where it was zero to 20 minutes uh, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. Yep. So whatever bracket of time they were in would dictate how much volume and intensity they would do on the yeah. Monday. Yeah, man. Which is very different to, say, for someone training with a personal trainer, regardless if they're a sportsman or not, that they come in and they've got a set program and that happens regardless of anything else and kind of forgets about the aspect yeah. of... I know the Otago team were having to chart their uh, their fluid intake and, and everything on the, the next couple of days as well. So they'd come in on Monday morning and they'd factor that into how much load or how much uh, how much volume they'd do during that week, depending on how well they'd recovered with respect to their fluid and food intake, that sort of thing. So take it to another level again, above and beyond just the load they'll put in on the on the Saturday. Yeah, so when, when we were in Japan, uh, we had a recovery system. So it was pretty much on the Sunday all the players who played would come in for recovery and every mode of recovery would be 10 points and you had to rack up 100 points in order to be able to leave the clubhouse. So a protein shake was 10 points, foam rolling was 10, you know, um, hot and cold shower was 10, things like that. Fuck, that's great, bro. It's great. It's just a, it's just a great concept. I like it. You know, and it's it's interesting because this is, this is what you... Uh, and Mike will find very funny. So for years, I have been talking to my bodybuilding friends and bodybuilders and said progressive overload is the most important thing when it comes to adaptation or muscle growth. Yeah. For years, people were telling me, oh, you're just the powerlifter. You're just, you're just telling us to chase the numbers. And fuck me daisies. These days, everyone's talking about, oh, deadlifts, oh, squats, oh, Beat the logbook. It's yeah. nothing new. No, no, no. You know, people no. are just trying to reinvent the wheel. That's it. Look, look. Every every uh, generation comes out with the same thing, but with a different label. And look, what I'm doing now. You know, people go, "Oh, that's kind of the new school way of training." I'm thinking, well, you know, 30 years ago we kind of did something similar when we were powerlifting, anyway. So, you know, there's nothing new. It's just uh, um, you know, put a new terminology in it. And a few fancy changes in there, but um, I have to agree, you know. And I think progressive overload is a great concept for um, obviously strength athletes. Obviously, um, but a lot of bodybuilders are heading down that pathway now. Um, but for fighters, you think progressive overload is the trick? Yeah, to a degree. Like it, it all depends on. So you do you can manipulate progressive overload in terms of rest periods and things like that as well yep. for what you're trying yeah, to yeah, achieve. Yeah. So it's not just about load. So yeah. for a lot of fighters, 
Um, like I said, structural balance is key. Joint integrity is key. Hey, just, just so I'm trying to kind of clear on it. So, like for for um, myself um, as a bodybuilder, progressive overload to me is about beating the numbers, yeah. beating the weight, or beating the form in which I I yes. com completed that exercise. If I was a strength athlete, uh, sorry, or a fighter. Um, would I be looking at things like um, progressive overload by decreasing time between sets? Would that be something? Yeah, that so could... it all it all basically depends on on where the person's at and what you're trying to achieve. So there's nothing new here, but say depending on the block of training they run, and say they had a strength session, within that strength session you will be trying to break new ground on that movement. Yep. If that is the purpose of that session, if the purpose of the session is to beat a certain time on a circuit, that's what you'll be aiming for. Yeah. You know, yeah. so even if so, even if I have someone doing a circuit, and we'll use this as an example. So I have, it's not originally mine. Um, I got it handed down to me by my mentor Ashley Jones. So it's called the Beastly Circuit. So uh, number of the beast six six six. So six exercises, six reps. Six sets, back to back, with one, uh, one or two kettlebells, and with a yep. minute of cardio on the end too, non-stop. Well, I've done it before, yep. Yep. and uh, typically, it will take you anywhere between twenty-five and thirty minutes. So you could go into that. You know, the, the next time you attempt that, you'd be looking at doing it in a quicker time or with with more weight or yeah. getting a better cardio time um, cardio output at the end of that session any of so those pretty much on what you you're chasing yeah yeah so pretty much what we do is an example is someone could start with a 12 kg kettlebell mm -hmm. and because they're not used to that kind of training they could, I've had, is very, very rare that someone who isn't used to that kind of training will get through all six rounds with ease. Yeah, yeah. I don't but I've had to pull people, I've had to pull people out at like round four. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. because the execution and the technique is strong. hindered by the fatigue. Yep, yep. So for a lot of people, progressive overload is going from four rounds to five yep. rounds. To yeah. six rounds and then once you get the six rounds it's going from 12 kg kettlebell to 14 yeah 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 cool you know and then the modes of cardio so for a lot of people um i have liked to mix it up so i've done things like uh got them on the bike got them on the rower and if they're really game we get them on the assault bike mm. but th again those are all kind of progressive overload forms of yeah. cardio that you can do because uh, the way that you do them also gets harder. And it, you know, it also depends on, so the minute of cardio, it can either be a minute at 110 plus RPM on the spin bike, or I can do a, if I really want to be cruel, I can do 60 to 80 RPMs on the bike, but it has to be a climb. Yeah, so they have to yeah. crank the resistance up. Oh, bro, way too brutal for me, man. <laughs> hey, Mike, you, you, sorry, just got a couple more things. You've actually answered, like, I had a whole list of questions here. You've already answered most of them. So just had a couple of little things. Um, is it common, I mean, I know you don't do the fight training, but to get the athletes really, really uh, fatigued uh, through their muscular endurance or cardiovascular work and then get them to try and execute uh, skill stuff, do they do, or does that happen in their fight uh, and their rolling sessions? Yes, so it's actually very interesting that you say that because um when i did my judo training and this is very recently we used to do training like that so my my coach he's currently getting ready to qualify for the olympics jason costa um, and we did a lot of tra training like that so you would do 20 seconds on 10 seconds off of say like a resistance drill and then you might do a bodyweight drill, and then you might do actual judo um, throws or 
Uchikomi. So Uchikomi is pretty much practicing to get him for the throw. So you're doing all these things under fatigue and duress mm. because that's the way that you're going to be competing and training as well. Mm. Yeah. Yep. But my thing is, so I've done this with, uh, with fighters before too. So you have, you have a system, and I know uh, a lot of coaches have the system where if someone's getting ready, you'll have them, their back against the wall, and you'll have fresh fighters coming in one after the other, yep. trying to peel them off. So what that does is basically it gives you that fight or flight, but it also forces you to execute that technique while you're having fresh bodies and you're fatigued. Mm. It's, just a, it's just a different feeling. Like I've, I've done all this kind of training um, and this is what I'm talking about, Mike, is I can emote and I can empathize with these fighters because I've gone through that kind of training myself. Mm-hmm. And when you, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain, but when you hear the clock counting down from 10 to 1 and your coach is screaming, you know, we've got to get those throws in, you don't really think about the detail. You don't think about, oh, I have to put my hand here. You just go on autopilot and it happens. And the more precise that autopilot can be, the better execution you get under. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So this is the thing too. So um, doing training under duress is important, but having the level of skill to be able to do that is also important. Hmm. So if your technique deteriorates straight away, then to me, it might be, the priority might be to work on the conditioning because you're not in a state to be able to maintain your technique under physical duress. Hmm. You know, so in rugby, as an example, uh, we did this in rugby too. So we did contact drills. So contact conditioning. So I remember um, my mentor setting up drills uh, with the tackle bags, breakdown drills. And then he would send them straight over to me and he would say, take them for two minutes of conditioning. And then I'd take them for two minutes conditioning, 12-22s, or you do... Uh, do you guys know what the Malcolm drill is? No, bro. Okay, so the Malcolm, the Malcolm drill is an old rugby league drill. So you're belly down on the half weight. Yep. You get up, you backpedal to 10 metres, down up. Yeah. You run to the far 10 metres, down yeah. up. No, I've done those. to half weight, yeah, down I up, did those. one. Yeah, did those with, um, when I played for Otago. Um, that was... Fucking horrific. It used to kill me. Yeah, so you do six of those. That's yeah. one Malcolm. Yeah. And oh. then they would have to go into their rugby drill pretty yeah. much straight away. Yeah. Or a little water break and then straight into the rugby drill. So all these kind of things are, I guess, the biggest thing that I can tell, tell you, Mike, is fatigue is the biggest color of decision making right in terms of sport and the most important thing in any sport is decision making or your ability to process detail and make decisions within a split second was it mike tyson that said everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face yeah pretty much (laughs) right yeah yeah Oh, I mean, there was a, there was a, there was, you've, you've given me bad memories now of, uh, of rugby, of rugby league training sessions and, and fuck how horrific. And, and actually, it kind of makes me realize that, um, you know, when we watch these, you know, rugby players, rugby league players, fighters, you know, when we watch them perform, just how much fucking work they do to get to that point, you know? And um, I think, it's pretty easy to forget that when you're when you're an armchair critic like like myself, but um, must be really rewarding to be the guy that fucking gets to work with some of these guys and watch them progress through their per- careers and actually um, see the improvement they're making when it comes to to D Day and they're in the ring or they're out playing rugby or whatever it is. Yeah, look, I've I've had um I've had one guy who I work with in Japan. He fought in Pancras. He was, he fought at 59 kgs. Yeah. 
And he first, we linked up on Instagram. And when I went to Japan, I caught up with him. And he said to me, you know, he was like, oh, I'm quite weak in the grapple. I don't feel like I have a whole lot of KO power. What do you think I need to work on? And he was also putting like crazy things up on his Instagram of uh, one hour of interval training. You know, sprints by the river. So I replied to him and I said, right, so when are we going to meet up and when are we going to sort this out? So he sat down with him and I said, okay, what are your goals as a fighter? And he told me his goals as a fighter. This is in 2018. And I said to him, right, so what's your training schedule like? And the amount of volume this guy was already doing in terms of uh, fight training, yeah. I kind of said to him, okay, fuck, you're only going to be able to do two weight sessions a week. Because I said, if we do any more, it's going to impact your fight training. And that's not what you want from the gym. Mm. So he was doing, I think he still does too now. So he was doing um, two full body strength sessions a week yep. that I was programming him for. And we managed to shave his interval training sessions uh, to 15 to 20 minute sessions, yep. but more intensity. Mm -hmm. So it's all about it's all about looking at the big picture. Yeah, well, I think you know one of the things that you know I guess I would look at from a very simplistic point of view is that he's not fighting for an hour. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so your specificity in terms of you know the length of those sessions, but also allowing him the ability to have the volume for the for the resistance training in order to get that knockout power. Um, you know, something has to give in that schedule. So it must be kind of with some people a bit of a balancing act, but with someone like that, you kind of walk in going, if this guy can do interval training for an hour, yeah. he's fucking hard as nails. So if I can get him the right yeah. direction and, and the and the knowledge, this guy's gonna fucking just be dynamite. Yeah, and pretty much uh interesting we talk about that topic of mental fortitude because um you know, I messaged Dan Hooker the other day yeah. when he was in isolation and he put up on a story, he clocked up 10 kilometers in his fucking hotel room. <laughs> he had carpet burn. Holy shit. Like, this is what I mean. This is Fuck. when when we're talking cream of the crop, MMA fighters, some of the best in the world, their mentality is when I go in there, I am willing to die this is how I put food on the table for my family. Yeah. And I messaged him and I said, you crazy motherfucker. Yeah, fuck. Ad so, ad admirable as shit though, bro. Like, oh, you know, fucking take your head off to, to anyone that, that has got the, you know, the tenacity and, and stickability to do what you have to do to get to that level. And I think it's really cool. It's really exciting in New Zealand at the moment like having that kind of that pathways kind of been created and we're yeah. starting to channel some of our talent into the limelight. And I think it's going to be, um, there'll be a lot more to follow, I think. Yeah. And it's, it's quite interesting because my next uh, podcast that I'm going to do with Dan is actually going to be about mental fortitude. Awesome. Bro, because keep, a, keep an eye out for that one. Yeah. Bro. yeah, Cause you and I both know it's, it does require some kind of mental fortitude to lift a certain amount of weight hmm. or train a certain way. But if you said to someone, a general member of the general public, hmm. that guy clocked up 10 Ks in his hotel room. That's just, that's pretty surreal. You know, yeah, like 10 Ks is a lot of distance, but th this is what I'm saying is a lot of the top fighters. So I'm not talking about amateur or grassroots level guys a lot of the top fighters have that mentality. Yeah, yeah. I think like when you get people like that, like I know that if you gave me someone like like Dan Hooker or someone that had that mental fortitude, you know, I know I could make him a top bodybuilder. I know I could make him a top powerlifter. I know I could make him a top strongman because he's got something that the average person hasn't got that allows him to do things that the average person couldn't do. Um, and I think that kind of trait that you're talking about 
um, the trait that allows you to do 10Ks and get fucking carpet burn in a, in a hotel room is the kind of thing that all elite athletes have to have, regardless yeah, yeah. So, really of sport or, or anything. Yeah, so I guess it's one of those things where um, you can't, you can teach skill. And this is, this is uh, what Coach Carl Weber said to me. He said, I can teach you skill, but I can't teach you heart. And this is kind of rings true. So you'll understand too. And this kind of rings true to any kind of sport or physical activity. And you know, within bodybuilding, when you get to that point um, where you want to rack the weight, but your mind's saying no, but your body's saying, Nate, we've got two more reps in us. What are you going to do? Are you going to pump them out and then rack it? Or are you going to rack it prematurely? I'll keep going until I can't fucking wreck it. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's the thing. And that's, you know? that's, the, that's why I guess we're all here and we're all talking because we all have that similar mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you too, Mike, you've done bodybuilding. You've had your career. Like, you've been there, done that. So I guess for me, it's one of those things where we are all talking about a subject where we can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you all both know that, especially with bodybuilding, um, it's a mixture of, especially at elite level, it's a mixture of the right genetics and that champion mindset. Yeah, I think um, John Davies summed it up well for me. He said that, you know, anyone that has got that, that fucking drive and, and instinct, you know, and that will just do, you know, do whatever they have to do to get there will achieve to a relatively high level. But once you get on the Olympia stage, then the genetic dispositions and the work ethic come into play, you know, and you don't make it, you don't make it there without either of those two things, you know. Um, and I guess, you know, we've seen that in rugby and that as well. Like, you know, you've got some really just outstandingly talented players. You've got some players that are the hardest working guys on the planet and that's why they're there. And then you get a guy like, say, McCaw, who has got, you know, the genetic predispositions that, you know, his, his recovery scores were phenomenal, but he had a work ethic like like nobody's business. And and that kind of, I think, you know, that very few that have got the mix of both. But um, I think, uh, to me, it's always been about finding the guys that have got the heart and that because they're willing to do the work, you know. And we'll see if they've got the genetics further down the track, you know, or if they've got the... In, in the case of, um, you know, in fight sports, whether they've got the, the physical ability to do what they need to do. Um, but yeah. without that heart, you're not even going to get this, not even getting started. Yeah, are you? and, that's, and that's, that's what sets a lot of uh, people apart. So I guess my training clientele, I don't, re I have a couple general population clients. Yeah. But, you know, I train a lot of guys and girls who, just want to train serious. So I have a young guy who I'm prepping because um, he directly, so I'm not a prep coach, but I've done it myself. Yeah. I know how to do it. Um, and I'm very jealous of how many carbs this guy can have while getting <laughs> shredded because I know what I need to do to get shredded. So he's on, I've got him on, uh, so carb cycling, but on his high day, he has 500 grams of carbs. How he's far young, out young natural guy and he's dropped. He's dropped almost 10 kgs and he's getting stronger. And I'm just sitting there. And I had a chat to him the other day and I said, you have the right mix of parents and you have the right brain for bodybuilding. Yeah. Because, you know, this guy, he just says to me, he says, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And that's music to my ears because yeah. you both know how rare that is for someone yeah. at 22, 23. Yeah. yeah. Look, honestly, when you find people like that, it's it's a fucking it's just joy, man. Like, you know, oh, yeah. I've I've met probably one guy like that since I've been back training in Hawke's Bay for eighteen months. One guy that I've come across that I've gone, fuck, this guy's got what it takes. You know, he's fucking it, leaving no stone as a, as a phys ed teacher, I see a ton of kids and I see a ton of talent, but I very rarely see that work ethic uh, combined with it. Uh, most of the people who have a real drive and work ethic are a bit like me, just grafters, you know, not actually that talented. So I've thought and tried to work out how you can create, integrate both. Have someone who's enormously talented and yet 
does it, you know, looks at the big picture, looks at the big pond instead of a, instead of feeling like the big fish and going, yeah, I'm good enough. I don't have to work very hard. Yeah, and, so to, and to build onto that, that, it's interesting you say that, Mike, because uh, my mentor, Phil Mooney, uh, who was the guy from the Queensland Reds, he said to me, have you heard of uh, the, the open mindset or the growth mindset? Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah so he said to me about this when we were coaching in japan and he said oh look into this uh book called the growth mindset by carol dweck he said it will help you with your coaching career and i started to look into it and he there was a study i'm not sure if you're familiar with the study but they did a study and they had two separate groups so they had one group which they said you did well in the test because you were smart and then they had the other group that said you did well in the test because you worked extremely hard and you put the effort in. Mm. They tested eight weeks later, the one who the ones who were rewarded on talent scored lower, the ones who were rewarded on effort scored higher. Mm. So that is pretty much that's surprising, pretty much bro. That's you know? what what's that book? I'm quite interested in that. It's, a uh, growth it's mindset. called The Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck. Cool. So, so D-W-E-C-K. So when you're uh, p- providing positive reinforcement for, for especially young kids, but athletes, you talk about yeah. how hard they've worked and the effort they've put in as opposed to the, uh, the outcome or the talent or the, the ability. Yeah, so what I, what I do and what I've found with a lot of uh, the people that I train um, is basically it's, it's human nature that if we give too much praise, or do too much for most people, people become complacent. That's just the way we're wired. They end up taking things for granted, like in, in anything in life. So what I've found is I will give praise where it's warranted, but the way that I give praise will either be technical or effort-based. Not outcome. <laughs> yeah, not... Well, not outcome, but I mean... I guess I don't reward, I don't say, oh, you did that because you're a great player or you did that because you've got the right parents or, you know, I try and, I guess, emphasize the fact that, you know, your technique was real good or you worked real hard or you've been putting in the effort or you've been consistent. So I've got a group of boys that I train at the moment and um, one of them in the group, I've been training them for less than a year. One of them in the group got up to 55 kg flat dumbbells for sets of 10. Nice. And he's miles ahead of all the other guys. Yeah. Um, fully natural, been training mm-hmm. you know, with me for like maybe eight months. And I said to him, I said, the reason why you are moving the weights you're moving versus the others in the group are the fact that you have never missed a session. Mm. And you'll remember this, Nate. Um, yeah, when I first started, Dave Smith said to me, I was a kid and I said to him, what's the best advice you could give me, Dave? And he said, never miss a meal, never miss a workout. And he said, that's half the battle done. Absolutely, bro. Absolutely. You know, and I'm, for, yeah, for a lot of athletes and for a lot of um, people, training is only one part of the equation. So I guess... A lot of fighters, especially professional fighters, they have sponsorships. They have things that, you know, like Dan Hooker's got Go Paleo Meals. I know a couple other fighters uh, hooked up with Muscle Fuel. So they're like robots. This is why they can perform at that level. They don't have to think about, oh, I've got to cook dinner or I've got to measure my carbs or, you know. Yeah, you know, and I, I look at that and people go, oh, they're so lucky. And I'm like, they're not fucking lucky. Yeah. They They've made earned the choices right to, 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 to be able to do that. They had to do to position themselves there to now be able to do the things they need to do to perform. So you no guarantee that before it. someone else was providing the meals, they still didn't miss a meal. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and a similar story, um, I saw something the other day and GSP, George St. Pierre, mm-hmm. before he made it in the UFC, he was working on a rubbish truck. You know, and there's that story of Jimmy Crute in the UFC who still lives um, off grid in a camper van with his girlfriend, even though he's making bank in the UFC. Yeah, yeah. This is just, this is what I'm saying is um, a lot of the cream of the crop athletes, they give back. 
you know, and they and they do things, and you know, it, it's one of those things where that mentality you have to have at that elite level is few and far between. I don't know how many how many people have that kind of mentality. Very few, I would imagine. I did the, I did an, an exercise back when I was a math teacher, Mike. We did a statistical exercise about how many kids play rugby at the high school, how many of those made the first 15, how many of those went on to make um, the premier side, how many of them made the regionals, who got a Super 12 contract and who could ultimately make the ABs. And the fucking maths equation on that was uh, a very, very tiny percentage. So those put people that could make it in professional as a professional fighter versus all the kids that start off in um, in jujitsu or judo or um, kickboxing etc you know you're talking you know that many you know yeah She's, uh, it's interesting though because if you're realistic about it you'd give up straight away wouldn't you so you've got to have a sort of <laughs> a unrealistic uh, aspiration to at least to, to <laughs> devote everything to something that's you know statistically unlikely to happen yeah, well, what I what I believe in, Mike, is um, I believe in if you cover all bases, if you do everything you can humanly control and you reach a certain level, you've done everything you can to get to that level. Mm. You know, whereas there's, there's a lot of New Zealand fighters who have been in the game a long time and might not ever get to the UFC. But they've done everything they can to get to the level they're at. So that's the level they will be at. Yeah, yeah we've had, Mike and I have had that conversation, you know, about bodybuilding and saying that, like, sometimes, you know, you do everything in your power to achieve what you can achieve. Um, but the scorecards might not always be what you want. And it is what it is. So, yeah. Focus on the things that you can control, people. Hey, um, we're going to have to wrap this up because um, we've sort of dragged you along for a long time now. And, it's all um, good. I'm starting to get hungry. Same. <laughs> good shit. Well, uh, look, um, thank you very much, Bryn, for, for coming and joining us and really kind of opening my eyes to how much, you know, there is to know in that game. And, and you know, I think if there's people out there um, that are fighters that want to um, develop themselves in terms of strength and conditioning, talk to Bryn. Uh, but before we go, Bryn, what we always do is we hand over to you and let you do a bit of a shout out and a thanks to those people that have supported you and helped you along the way and helped you get where you are today. Yeah, so I guess for me, uh, obviously Dave Smith and Lisa, they have pretty much given me all the bodybuilding knowledge that I have to this day. Um, and that has helped me a lot in terms of, so bodybuilding is very important in fight training as well, because it kind of comes into play where you need to have lactate tolerance in your arms and shoulders and different muscles. So what I would use to describe my method is it's a blend of everything. Mm but it has to have transferability, right? So I want to obviously thank them. Um, and Ashley Jones, my mentor. Uh, I've known him for more than half my life. Uh, David Neath, my mental skills coach. He has, he has helped me in ways that uh, I never thought were possible for me um, in terms of unlocking parts of my brain and controlling, controlling the fire, because I remember at one GPC comp, this is how we linked up. I was running around uh, listening to Disturbed, but pretty much the whole meet, back-to-back -back songs. Mm. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and he took my earphone out, and he goes, mate, you've been walking around like a madman for the past 30 <laughs> minutes. When are you on? And I said, oh, I'm on in about 10 minutes. And he goes, bro, chill the fuck out. Do that when you're about to deadlift. And that's when I was like, yeah. yeah, I need to talk to that guy. Yeah, yeah he was a great guest. Enjoyed having him on the podcast. Probably one of my favorite ones. Yeah, yeah and I guess shout out to uh, some of my most loyal friends who have 
like back in the industry. So Kagan Auden, he's uh, my best friend. Kagan, best man Kagan. At, his, at his wedding. Kagan, we caught up on the weekend. We want to talk to you. We want to talk to you, Kagan. Bryn, you push him. You push that yeah, boy. I'll, I'll so, get him on. I'll get yeah, him on. Yeah, I definitely. Uh, he's I've, him, him and his brother. You know, they're, they're both really good guys. I want to talk to. You. Sorry, carry on. Uh, and my boy Jordan Earl, aka the Freak. Uh, yeah, Tom Mack. Tom obviously, Mack. he he helped me a lot. Yourself, Nate. Um, you know, you've looked after me countless times when I've been up in Auckland and things like that. I won't forget because. You, Thank you, bro. Been a pleasure. You let me sleep on your couch. You took me around. <laughs> we went out. You took me around Auckland for the first time. Um, it could have been dangerous. <laughs> you know, but to me, yeah, to no. me, I hadn't achieved anything great at that point, but you still believed in me. So Choice, bro. Uh, Choice. I hold that pretty close to my heart. Awesome, bro. You know, and Appreciate you believed in me, and, and all that kind of support led me to where I am today. And it's all a collective effort. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to say, uh, say thanks to you for that. Appreciate it, bro. And um, yeah, in return, I'll be helping you out with Xavier's program. Thank you, bro. It means a very means a lot to me. It means a lot to me. And I know Xavier's extremely excited. So, um, man, look, if you're looking for someone who's mentally fucking tough, like boy makes, puts me to shame, brother. He's So I look forward to that. That'll be choice. Be cool. Yeah, so uh, that's yeah, and and I guess uh, Phil Mooney as well. Uh, he would be he'll be the last person, and um, yeah, he helped me with the whole coaching side of things. He is the most detailed rugby coach I have ever met, and he said to me, "As your job, as a coach, if you can get your message across to the person you're trying to talk to, that's your job." And he said, "If they." action what you want them to action based on what you've told them that's your job done you know and he taught me the differences between um different types of coaching and different individuals and that's helped me as a trainer and as a coach within the gym as well yeah man and i've got to say the way you talk um really kind of shows me that you're not just providing a consulting service you're actually genuinely coaching these athletes and you're and you know, helping them achieve their potential. So, fuck, it's been really cool having you, bro. And we'll Cheers, definitely Cheers, have to Mike. catch up again yeah, soon. Uh, on, next time on Crosswich. So, I'll let you know when I'm uh, in Napier Hastings area. Do We're going to be up in Crosswich for the uh, for the big uh, meet in July with uh, J- Jackson Hinch's uh, show. Oh, yeah, bro. Well, nice. Yes. We'll catch up then, eh? Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. That sounds good. Right, people, right. stay Cheers, safe guys. out there. Cool.